Good day, everyone, and welcome to Encyclopedia Hermetica, A Big History, Part 29. So, we're going to take up where we left off last lecture, and that was with the Roman gods. The plan today is then to discuss the Roman goddesses specifically. I'll talk predominantly about the Olympian goddesses, those female goddesses of the Dei Consentes, then I'll finish off with a discussion of the Great Mother, the Magna Mater, or Megalameter, known in Rome as Kibili, from about 205 BC onwards. Now, before carrying on with the main goddesses of the Roman pantheon, I want to discuss a couple of goddesses who were quite important throughout the Roman world. At least, they were important enough to have their own minor flamines. You'll find that these goddesses don't really have analogs in the Greek world, so they're generally never discussed in these kind of summary uh, presentations. These goddesses are, uh, from among others I won't go over, Carmenta, Flora, Furina, Palatua, and Pomona. I won't get into terribly much detail about them, but I'll sketch out a quick profile for you here. Carmenta was a goddess of childbirth and prophecy. Her name was derived from the Latin word carmen, which means song, but with the subtle implication of a magical chant or spell. She stood vigilant watch over mothers, children, and midwives. She was also said to have invented the Latin alphabet, uh, what with all its magical connotations and abilities. It should go without saying, with an audience like you guys, that words have magical properties. They, they change the world around you. So it's no surprise that all these concepts, words, songs, spells, protection, that these are all wrapped up into this one goddess, Carmenta. Now, next up, we have Flora, who was the Latin response to the Sabine goddess of flowers and springtime. Now, Flora was just one from among several fertility goddesses in Rome, but Flora specifically was goddess of youth. I suppose it's part of a lot of cultures, but there's a lot of language in Latin which connects the idea of youth and plant life, and this goddess is an embodiment of those ideals. Okay, next we have Pomona, a wood nymph, whose name was derived from the word pomum, fruit, uh, this is where the French word pum comes from, apple. Uh, this particular goddess governed the concept of fruitful abundance. She was not so much the goddess of harvesting fruit as much as she was the goddess of growth itself. Pomona, like Flora, had her own lesser flamen and a shrine at Rome. Next we have Furina, who was a very obscure and ancient Roman goddess. Uh, her cult dated back to the earliest period of Roman history, being one of the 15 gods who had her own flamen, but what she was all about is kind of speculative. Uh, there's some evidence that Furina was associated with spring water, and there's been some attempts to linguistically link her name back to the Indo-European root Brun, or the Sanskrit Burvan, which means uh, the moving or bubbling of water, making it cognate with the Gothic word Bruna, spring, or Latin Ferwere, from Frur, with its vowel metastasized into Fur, meaning to bubble or boil. This was the speculation of Georges Dumézy, who uh, is a rather old and sometimes far-fetched source, but I think in this case we may be able to trust his judgment. Lastly, before moving on, we've got Palatua, who was basically the goddess of the Palatine Hill. As was mentioned in previous lectures, it was not unusual for landmarks like hills and springs to have their own residing gods. Uh, Palatua was one such goddess who found herself swept up into a place of great importance just by virtue of the Palatine Hill's importance, geographically speaking. Aside from this nugget of information, there is little else to say about her. Uh, her cult, like those of Falaker or Volturnus, who I didn't mention last lecture, uh, dwindled in importance during the late Republican period, and then by the beginning of the Imperial Era, there were few, if any, followers aside from the Flamen. So, 
what we can see thus far emerging is a pattern that the goddesses are all chiefly associated with sustenance, with the life-giving and life-maintaining forces. We'll find that by and large, the Olympian goddesses were mostly, though not entirely, also devoted to these concepts. The first of the Olympians I want to discuss uh, who embodied these ideals first and foremost was Ceres, the goddess of grain, harvests, fertility, and motherhood. In Greek, she was known as uh, Demeter, or Demeter, which literally just means mother goddess. Uh, Ceres was one of many aspects of the goddess celebrated from time immemorial in Africa and on in through the Middle East and into old Europe. Uh, you could say that Ceres was a highly tamed and civilized version of one of her parallel developments, Kibili. She was the mother of Proserpina, who is the Latin equivalent of Persephone slash Kore, uh, the central character to the Alice in Wonderland-like Katabasis myth, which lay at the heart of the Eleusinian mysteries. Now, Ceres' name uh, derives from the reconstructed Proto-Indo-European word care, which means to satiate or to feed. This is also the root for the Latin crescere, to grow, or the English create and increase. Now, we know this through Indo-European linguistic scholarship, which obviously the Romans had no conception of. Roman etymologists themselves believe Ceres to have come from the Latin verb gerere, to bear, bring forth, produce, because of her agricultural and maternal dimensions. Ceres goes way back into the Archaic period, and she was worshipped by the Latins, the Oscans, and the Sabines, though less surely among the Umbrians and the Etruscans. Ceres was credited with the discovery of spelt wheat, uh, Latin far, like the French word farin for flour. Uh, she was responsible for the gift of agriculture to humankind, and behind the idea of yoking oxen and plowing fields. Goddesses and cattle have a relationship which goes way back to even pre-agricultural times. Before this gift of agriculture, the Romans believed man had survived on acorns and wandered the world in a lawless, wretched state, which, in a sense, they kind of did. The undertaking of agriculture issued in that golden age of Saturn, which was, of course, but a stepping stone to Rome's glory. Uh, Virgil gave her the epithet Legifera, law-bearing, a direct translation of Demeter's Greek epithet, Thesmophoros. Now, all these associations with the agricultural dimensions of Roman life meant that Ceres was more concerned with the common farmer than with the elite aristocrat. That being said, Ceres was the patron god and protectrix of plebeian laws, plebeian rights, and uh, the goddess of their representatives to the Senate, the plebeian tribunes and the aediles. These guys were instituted so the consuls couldn't arbitrarily tamper with the laws of Rome. Their positions were sacrosanct and inviolable. Uh, they were immune to threat or arrest, and whoever violated such protection had their property forfeit to Ceres. Ceres' temple, games, and cult were at least in part funded by fines imposed on those who offended such laws. Her Aventine temple served as a cult center for the plebeian class specifically, uh, not unlike the Metroon in Athens, which was a legal archive, a treasury, and possibly even a law court. This place may even have served as an asylum for those who threatened with arbitrary arrest by patrician magistrates. Temples were, after all, uh, go-to places for asylum, and there's no lack of legends about people being cursed by gods for attacking their devotees after they'd thrown themselves upon their altars for protection. Now, since law-bearing Ceres created the first field and established its boundaries, she was the one who determined the course of lawful, sedentary agricultural life. Crimes against someone's field were crimes against Ceres. 
Whoever let their flocks graze on lands which weren't theirs were fined in the name of Ceres and the Roman people. Uh, this fine was issued by the, the plebeian aediles. There were ancient laws from the Twelve Tablets forbidding people from magically charming the crops of one neighbor into one's own fields. Monsanto uses this magic now. It's called a patent. Uh, and even the death penalty was involved for people found guilty of tampering with field boundaries. Any adult caught damaging or stealing crops was, quote, to be hanged to Ceres. Toward the end of the Second Punic War, around 205 BC, an officially recognized cult of Ceres and Proserpina was brought to Rome from southern Italy, along with its Greek priestesses. In Rome, they maintained the Ritus Graecus Cerarius, and its priestesses were granted Roman citizenship, so their prayers might not become a conflict of interest. The cult was based on the ancient, ethnically Greek cult of Demeter, most notably with regards to the women's only festival, the Thesmophoria. Uh, a year after they brought in the Ritus Cerarius, Patrician senators sent for the cult of the Greco-Phrygian goddess Kabili to be brought to Rome and established as the Magna Mater. Like Ceres, Kabili was a manifestation of that pan-Mediterranean earth goddess motif, but Kabili in particular, with her ties to Mount Ida in Phrygia, had mythological ties to Troy, and thus to Aeneas, the mythological ancestor of Rome. I'll get back to the cult of Kabili at Rome at the end of the lecture. Uh, for now, the last thing I want to say before I move on is that throughout the Republican period and beyond, the mystery rites of Eleusis continued in Greece. Any Greek-speaking Italian could travel to Athens and undergo the initiation process, which took about a year. And many did. While Romans went through initiation at Eleusis and returned, it, it was the Roman series they envisioned as the chief figure of this mystery drama. So when they came back to Italy after having been initiated, they brought back all that mystical baggage from Demeter and the mystery tradition at Eleusis, and then inevitably they tacked it on to the profile of Ceres. This was but another way uh, the two respective goddess traditions were syncretized. In Book 4 of Virgil's Aeneid, uh, he glosses over the Demeter Persephone Hades story, but with the Latin equivalent standing in their place. And I quote, When Ceres sought through all the earth with lit torches for Proserpina, who had been seized by Dispater, she called her with shouts where three or four roads meet. By this point in history, we can safely say that all these figures, uh, Demeter, Ceres, Persephone, Proserpina, Hades, Dispater, have already become indistinguishable from one another. Okay, moving on. Next, we've got the queen of the gods, Juno. Uh, Latin, Juno, Etruscan, Uni, uh, Greek, Hera. Since the time she'd been conjured out of Veii and brought to Rome through an evocation ritual, Juno was the mother protector of the state. Before this, in Rome, she had the names Lucina, Mater, and Regina. Some think she was also known as Curitis before the evocatio of the Juno of Falerii, and that could be true. Together with Jupiter and Minerva, Juno Capitolina was worshipped as part of the sacred triad on the Capitoline Hill in Rome. According to mythology, she was the daughter of Saturn, and both the sister and wife of Jupiter. Naturally, Juno had a particular place in the hearts of women in Rome. She was often depicted as a matronly woman sitting with a peacock, which was her sacred animal. Uh, the, the name Juno is believed to be connected to the Latin word euinis, or the same word in English, youth, through a syncopated form of eun, such as uh, in junior, younger. Juno was a goddess of marriage, and the idea that women were the younger in a relationship in ancient Rome should go without saying. Typically, men married when they were in their late 30s or early 40s, and they generally married girls who'd just begun menstruating, which 
in the relatively lutein-deprived environments of the ancient world, was around 14 to 16 years old. So, this is probably what her name is all about. Youth. Juno's theology is highly complex, even more so than the theology of most other goddesses in Rome. Juno had many epithets, many names, and many titles representing all her various facets. Virtually every step of womanhood had her own distinct Euno, and these got real specific. One, for example, was Euno Kinxia, she who looses the bride's girdle. Uh, another one of her aspects was Euno Moneta, and this is where we get our word for money, because her particular temple was used as Rome's official mint and treasury. Euno Moneta was a kind of military aspect of Juno. As much as she was a youthful queen, she was also legendarily jealous and quick to wrath. Most of the Aeneid is based on Juno trying to thwart Aeneas' fleet as they flee from Troy, and all the shenanigans that she causes for them. From among the cults of all the Italic Junos, there's a distinct triad of concepts which were attributed to her. 1. Regality, 2. Military protection, and 3. Fertility. So, what do these three things have in common? Well, life exuberant life, and this will be a dominant theme in this lecture. Now, there's really an overwhelming amount of things to say about Juno and all her various aspects and temples and all this and that, but something tells me that this would get really dry quickly, and so I'm going to move on, and if any of these details become relevant as we go forth, I can come back to them. Next up, we have Minerva the second female of the Capitoline Triad. Of all the goddesses of Rome, Minerva was the most masculine. Just like her Greek counterpart Athena, Minerva was the goddess of wisdom, warfare, and craft, from poetry to weaving. Uh, I actually think it's fair to say that Minerva was really a man's woman. Uh, she was always depicted as strong, young, and beautiful, but as the myth goes, she was born out of the head of Zeus, fully armed for battle. She is completely divorced from the maternal or the erotic principles that are characteristic of many other Roman goddesses, hence why she has to come straight from the mind of Zeus, the father principle. The myth, more specifically, goes like this. After impregnating the titan Metis, whose name means wisdom or skill, Jupiter recalled a prophecy given to him long, long ago that he would one day be overthrown by his child, and this would perpetuate the succession of the gods. Now, being afraid that their child would be the one to overturn the order of heaven, Jupiter swallowed Metis whole, which seems to be a thing that supreme gods like to do, and now, being immortal... Metis spent her days inside of Jupiter, and she spent these days forging weapons and armor for the child that she was uh, waiting to give birth to. Now, all this hustle and bustle inside of old Jove left him with a big headache, and so to relieve him of the pain, he ordered Vulcan to use a hammer and to smash his head open. Uh, Vulcan did what he was told, and from the crater he produced in Jove's head, Minerva emerged, fully equipped for war. This is how she's always depicted, armed for battle, and she's typically accompanied by an owl, who symbolizes wisdom. Now, if Minerva and Diana seem to have a similar feel to you, what with their militant virginities, and it's probably because of this. The name Minerva has its roots in an Italic moon goddess named Meneswa, of she who measures and this is in accordance with the calendrical tradition. The Etruscans adopted the old Latin name Menerwa, so it's possible that they stem from a similar tradition. The Etruscan Menerwa was part of a holy triad with Tinia and Uni mirroring the Roman Capitoline triad of Jupiter, Juno, and Minerva. 
Okay, next up we have Venus, uh, who actually had a rather more tenuous place in Roman society than she did in Greek society. In Greek conception, Venus, who represents erotic love, was always having sex but never having children. This, this was not her thing. In the Roman conception, however, she was basically the mother of the state. Uh, she was the mother of Aeneas. So, in one facet, she maintained the typical image of a young seductress uh, embodying eroticism, born out of the froth of Saturn's castration. And in another facet, she had a matronly character, which you can see expressed rather disproportionately in Virgil's Aeneid. The mother of the state had to have some pudicitia. It's this simultaneous sense of shame and dignity. We're almost certain that Virgil himself was a homosexual, and I really like to speculate whether this fact somehow had an impact on his conception of the feminine erotic principle in his poetry. In any case, Venus was officially married to Vulcan, who was then eternally cucked by Mars, who was also the father of the state, uh, by fathering Rome's mythical founders Romulus and Remus. Rome could, therefore, be thought of as the union of Venus and Mars. Julius Caesar claimed Venus as his genetrix, uh, the ancestress of his line. Her name was derived from the Latin word for sexual desire, Venus, and that, in turn, probably came from the Proto-Indo-European word wen, which means to strive for, to wish for, to desire, or to love. Venus has been described as, quote, an ill-defined and assimilative native goddess combined, quote, with a strange and exotic Aphrodite. In the sky, she was embodied by that bright orange ball the Greeks called Phosphoros, which the Latins translated as Lucifer, light bringer. In astrology and Western ritual magic, this planet would maintain all of the elements of Venus, the goddess, and they were synonymous, and this would be carried on into popular culture in the Western world. The first temple to Venus we're aware of was promised to Venus obsequens, uh, indulgent Venus, during the heat of combat against the Samnites. In good faith, it was dedicated in 295 BC at a spot near the Aventine Hill. This temple was allegedly to be funded by fines imposed on local women for sexual misconduct. Its rites were likely based on the Greek Aphrodite cults, which by this point had already spread in various forms throughout the wider Greek world, including Italy. By 217 BC, during the early phases of the Second Punic War against Carthage, which we'll try to cover at some point soon, Rome suffered a national disaster at the Battle of Lake Trasimene. As was traditional during states of national emergency, the books of the Sibylline Oracle were consulted, and these suggested that if Venus Erechina, the patron goddess of Carthage's allies on Sicily, could be evoked out of her city, Eryx, and made to come to Rome, Carthage might be defeated. Thus began the great game of spiritual mimetic capture the flag. Rome sieged Eryx, offered its goddess a great temple, then literally captured her idol and brought her to Rome, where it was enshrined in a temple on the Capitoline Hill as one of Rome's twelve chief Olympians, the Dei Consentes. Here she was stripped of her overtly Carthaginian characteristics, her, uh, Tanit or Astarte flavor, and this so-called foreign Venus became Rome's Venus, Venus Genetrix, Venus the Mother, which I just discussed. The way the Romans spun it for themselves was that this was the homecoming of an ancestral Near Eastern, therefore Trojan goddess, to her people. Rome's defeat of Carthage would only strengthen the idea that this Venus preferred being in Rome, not amongst filthy Carthaginian sympathizers. Now's a good time to move on to Vesta, who
who was basically the opposite of Venus. Vesta, or as the Latins pronounced her name, Vesta, uh, analogous to the Greek Hestia, was a goddess of sacred space. She was the maiden goddess of the hearth, of the home, of family. Now, how she can be a, a goddess of family and a virgin at the same time is beyond me, but the Romans took this virginity thing very, very seriously. Virginity was conceived of as the raw, unspent potential to give birth, on account of some ill-defined concentration of life force. This, in turn, through ritual, was transferred into flocks and fields. And it was not unlike the idea of storing up sexual energy in kundalini yoga. Now, a physical manifestation of this quote-unquote life force was fire. So, Vesta's presence was symbolized by a sacred fire that was never, ever, ever supposed to go out. And this burned eternally at her hearth as a symbol for the vitality of the Roman state. This fire burned strong until 391 AD, when pagan worship was outlawed in Rome by the Christian emperor Theodosius I. Hers was the only round temple in Rome, and all forms of water were forbidden from being brought in. Now, this fire, along with a number of other rites, was maintained by the Vestal Virgins. The, this was a cult of women who maintained chastity upon penalty of death by being walled in, and they served at Vesta's Hearth. This was literally Rome's only indigenous full-time priesthood. Uh, they were like pagan nuns who spent 30-year terms, and their abbot was the Pontifex Maximus. Some scholars have liked to see a good deal of commonalities between the cult of Vesta and the sacred fire cults of Persia and India, with whose traditions the Vestals may share a common ancestor. Now, here's an interesting factoid about the Vestals. Uh, when you became consul, you were assigned a group of elite bodyguards called lictors, and these guys' job was chiefly to protect the two consuls, and a large part of that meant clearing the streets as he walked around the city. So they carried these things called fasces, whence comes the English word fascist or faggot. Uh, these were not lethal weapons, they were made up of bundles of sticks into which axe heads could be inserted. These they used to threaten people to get out of the way to make the consul's life much safer and easier. Now, the only people in Rome who were exempt from getting beat if they didn't move were the Vestal Virgins. Now, I don't know what more to say about this factoid, but I think it's interesting to say the least. But I digress. Next, we have Diana, the Huntress, the actual moon goddess of the Roman pantheon. She was equated with the Greek Artemis and was therefore the sister of Apollo as well. She was a kind of virginal nature god with an aspect toward childbirth. It was said that a woman who died in childbirth was struck by the arrows of Diana. Diana was one of three virgin goddesses, along with Vesta and Minerva. There's a myth which is rather well known of a hunter named Actaeon, who happened to stumble upon the site of Diana bathing, and as a result, he was torn apart by her hunting dogs. Wrong place, wrong time, I guess. But this obviously gives us a sense of Diana's unassailable chastity and inaccessibility. This is why she's always ever so far away, elusive, uh, prowling atop high mountains and guarding sacred groves. Her name was related to the same word whence came the Greek word Zeus, or the Latin words Deus and Jupiter, uh, and that's the Indo-European word Diu, which has connotations of bright shining, so presumably Diana is the bright shining goddess, that is, the moon. Since time immemorial, the moon has been associated in Indo-European consciousness as the manifestation of the female principle. 
This would survive well into modern pop culture and on through astrology and ritual magic. The moon governed the month. She was a predictable cyclical entity and therefore was closely tied by analogy with the monthly cycle of women's menstruation, uh, with the cycle of the tides, with agricultural cycles. Now, I should mention here that the link here between women's menstrual cycles and the moon is coincidental and not causal. Uh, if it were causal, everyone would menstruate at the same time. Uh, it's more that the rhythms appear to us to line up, like when two independent windshield wipers on a bus match their rhythm, or when the beat of an Indian gamelan piece matches up before staggering again. If we look at the Olympian goddesses from a purely statistical point of view, we'll see we have three goddesses dedicated to chastity, one goddess dedicated to eroticism, and three dedicated to fertility, motherhood, and domesticity. This, at the very least, should show us that in the realm of ideals, there was a lot of anxiety about women's sexuality, which was a sublimated form of anxiety about the paternity of children. Obviously, chastity is not a factor worthy of reverence for male divinities. They just transformed into animals and took whatever they wanted. But for a goddess like Diana, her maidenhood was practically the essence of her being. Uh, here, I want to touch on this idea of the triplex goddess of which there were many, uh, but Hecate is probably the one most well-known of these threefold figures. Uh, I believe this whole threefold thing is a holdover from a much older time, before the goddess motif was brought in from the East millennia ago, and had become so fractured into individual figures along the lines of her three aspects, maiden, mother, and crone. So, if we have to imagine some sort of proto-goddess figure, she'd be like a two-dimensional triangular jewel, uh, with these three stages of womanhood as her facets. Over time, these got broken down through local variability into distinct gods, so for example, the maiden aspect became a Vesta, a Diana, or a Minerva, while the matron aspect became a Juno, or a Ceres, and so forth. The Romans intuited the shared origins of many gods, and they demonstrated this by the way they applied syncretism. So here's an example. Uh, Catullus wrote a poem to Diana in which she's called by a number of names. And here they are. Latonia, Lucina, Trivia, Luna, and most importantly to my point, Juno, Juno, the wife of Zeus. So how can Diana be the maiden goddess and also the mother goddess? Well, it, it all goes back to this idea of the threefold goddess. It was almost like there was a kind of Indra's web of goddesses, where each node was like a multifaceted jewel which reflected aspects of each other goddess. Uh, that whole web, to be extremely reductionistic, we can call the goddess. This is a, a, an impression or an archetype. One goddess, who, at least to the Romans, symbolized this impression or archetype, was the reconciler of all goddesses, the mother of all the gods, the Magna Mater. This was a, a Hellenized mountain slash earth goddess imported from Phrygia in modern day Turkey, which they called Kubile, or Kubule, uh, or in English we just say Kibili or Sibili. Both the Greeks and the Romans acknowledged the profound antiquity of she whom they understood to be the Phrygian mother. Now, the chief figure in the Phrygian pantheon had been Matar, the mother, and from the 6th century onwards, Greek religion had adopted this foreign goddess as Meter, uh, alongside of, not instead of, Demeter. 
She was often depicted in the presence of wild lions, birds, and snakes, and thus we could probably say that she was a mistress of savage nature, celestial flight, and chthonic descent. In Phrygia, she was venerated at door-shaped niches with reliefs or freestanding images hewn from rocky mountainsides. Greek-speaking lands syncretized her with Ge, Gaia, Demeter, and particularly with Rhea, the mother of Zeus, who birthed the Sky Father in a cave on Crete. In the Latin world, she was identified with Ceres, Juno, Ops, and a number of other goddesses, uh, including even Isis once Rome took Egypt, uh, as we see in Apuleius's Metamorphosis. Now, the most ancient and unambiguous discoveries of the lion-flanked goddess were those made at Chatal Huyuk in south-central Anatolia. This early Neolithic town of hunter-gatherers had religious sanctuaries and community commons which may well have served for orgiastic ritual purposes. These rooms contained symbolic wall paintings, ancillary burials, ritualistic cattlehead trophies, and most strikingly, the wall reliefs of a single great goddess with her arms uplifted and her legs spread open. Other excavated finds include female statuettes accompanied by a youthful consort, and the most famous female figure emerging from the site is a statuette of a woman enthroned and giving birth while being flanked by lions. The level of continuity between the great mother of the historical period and the one depicted at Chital Huyuk is remarkable. Here we have clear proof of religious iconographical continuity between the goddess of the Phrygians and the Anatolian mother of Chital Huyuk lasting well over 5,000 years. Now, I'm not implying here that there were any cults from classical Greece or Rome that ever practiced some wholly preserved and perfected Neolithic cult, but the relative consistency of the goddesses and their rites throughout the whole Mediterranean basin seems to suggest that they all stem from a common ancestor, who probably came from the Near East and who probably came from Africa before that. The parallels between the goddess of Chatal Huyuk and the Greco-Phrygian mother merely buttress the Greeks and the Romans' ideas that this goddess was older than all of their own gods. Over millennia, this rather consistent depiction of a mother goddess broke down into a wide range of local earth goddess variants, but she always maintained some degree of consistency. The widespread use of the name Kibili or Kubebe as a blanket designation for many indigenous Anatolian mother goddesses occurred only in the West, and that was on account of this one particular variant goddess from the temple state of Pessinus having been imported by Rome in 205 BC. There was a Trojan connection there, which the Romans really got off on. Uh, had some other local goddess variant been brought to Rome instead, it is likely that the name Kibili never would have been raised to such heights as to become the mother of all the gods. The goddess Kubaba, from whom Kibili took her name, was merely a minor deity in the Hittite pantheon. There once existed dozens, even hundreds, of local Hittite goddesses in Anatolia, which we now know little more than their names and titles. We know of Inara, a Hattic goddess of wildlife, not unlike the Greek Artemis. Halmasut, worshipped as the deified throne, like Isis in Egypt. Kamrusepa, a goddess of magic and birth rituals. And then finally, Kubaba, who over time appears to have assimilated the functions of all of these goddesses. From at least the time of the Old Babylonian period, Kubaba had been the city goddess of Carchemish. 
She was adopted into the Hittite pantheon when King Sepiluliuma I conquered and took over her city. After the fall of Hattusoth in the Neo-Hittite period, Kubaba achieved great standing in northern Syria and southeastern Anatolia, corresponding with the increasingly important role of the city of Carchemish. In the course of the early 1st millennium BC, Kubaba's influence became widespread in Anatolia and was syncretized into the pantheon of the newly arrived Phrygians from Thrace. From at least the 7th century BC onwards, the worship of the Phrygian mother was spread abroad in Greece and its colonies by means of itinerant specialists. These uh, played a role in increasing the number of votive monuments dedicated to the mother goddess throughout all of Magna Graecia from Anatolia to southern Italy. There are some testimonies about these kinds of holy men, the metragurtai, or the beggars of the mother, who made a living by establishing her rights abroad. Aristotle mentions the metragurtai as a pejorative equivalent to an Eleusinian priest, and one of his own disciples wrote how a destitute tyrant ended his life begging with his tambourine as a metragurte. The myths of Zalmoxis, Orpheus, and even Zagreus Dionysus can themselves be said to contain elements of these proselytizing types. Uh, these individuals were fundamentally shamanic figures. They were ecstatics who imported foreign deities and stretched out the influence of foreign gods well beyond the Anatolian mainland. Now, hallucination, madness, trance, dreams, and that utter sense of psychological abandon were in the jurisdiction of Meter, among many other things. Private sponsorship of Meter was, was widespread among the Greeks, and, and this was often prompted by dreams or visions. Uh, Pindar was said to have established a shrine dedicated to Meter in Thebes after he had a vision of the goddess's statue walking around. Her cult was brought into Magnesia by Themistocles after he'd been warned in a dream by the goddess of an assassination attempt. When struck with a wasting sickness and a refusal to sleep or eat, the chorus of Troisanian women wonder if, quote, the mountain mother, the Matros Oreas, had possessed Phaedra. Even the unwilling were disposed to becoming metroleptos, or one seized by the mother. This was the Greek word for epilepsy, the so-called sacred disease among the Latins. Out-of-body experiences, whether induced by uh, drugs or severe psychological perturbations, these are all potentially very terrifying and life-changing experiences, so in the ancient world, these kinds of episodes of temporary psychosis were associated with a divine origin. One Hippocratic treatise on epilepsy tells us that if a patient roars or suffers convulsions on the right side, the physicians say the mother of the gods is to blame. Now, along with Kabylie came Kabylie's cult of eunuch priestesses, the, the Gali. These individuals were very upsetting to Roman sensibilities, uh, much in the same way many trans people today are very upsetting to contemporary conservative tendencies. They had crazy festivals with loud music, which everyone in Rome perceived as irritating. Uh, they castrated themselves in public, and they threw their junk into people's front doors, they slashed their arms, and they sprayed pine trees with their blood. Uh, they kept their hair long and oiled, and they often seduced men. They, they wore perfume and women's clothes, and they danced in the streets. They were alarming to people. <laughs> Rome got so upset at the presence of Kabylie's priesthood, which, let's not forget, they wanted it there, uh, that they banned anyone with Roman citizenship from self-castration. Essentially, cutting off Romans from joining the ranks of the Gauli. The Romans imposed a superstructure over the foreign cult, and they were subject to the decisions of the Quindecem Viri. Despite this fact, it appears there was really little difficulty in recruiting Gauli from outside the Roman world, 
since it was a somewhat profitable way of life which provided opportunities for social advancement for men who could not have acquired it outside of such a priesthood. Among those deeply rooted in civic or familial life, self-dedication to the goddess was no easy task. Uh, something truly deep and insightful must have provoked the desire to relinquish one's past life. In the myths associated with the mystery cults, ecstatic gods were often defined by their androgynous nature, which had issued from a cosmic act of abscission. The mystery gods like Zagreus, Dionysus, Attis, Osiris, they had all themselves each suffered genital mutilation and death before returning to triumph over the grave. According to the 2nd century AD Nassene Gnostics, the dismemberment of Attis meant that he was abscised from the low, earthly regions of creation and carried up to the eternal essence, where he is neither male nor female, but a new being who is androgynous. The great mother's consort, uh, Attis, he had castrated himself at the instigation of the mother alone, establishing a, a ritual practice of self-castration. Castration and the dependence on a sanctuary made apostasy impossible for the remainder of a eunuch's life. Through this deed, her devotees became both sons and, like Attis, lovers of Kibili. This practice was done in a state of trance, uh, enthusiasm in, in the frame of a ritual where the candidate, encouraged by other participants, uh, was under the influence of flute music, suffumigations, and, and intoxication. By performing Attis's fatal acts, these priests identified themselves with Kabili's beloved and took on the god's name, uh, as did the votaries of Dionysus who took on the title of Bacchus upon initiation. This dilemma is the theme which inspired the composition of Catullus 63, wherein Attis, following his castration, cries out, Am I now to be driven to be a servant of the gods and Kabili's slave? Am I now to be a maenad? Am I now to play that part, to be a sterile man? Am I to live in the cold, snow-coated place of green Ida? Am I to spend my life under the high mountain tops of Phrygia, where the hind is a forest dweller, where the boar is a wood rover? What I've done distresses me now. Now I'm sorry. Catullus uh, brings to life the ambivalence in an initiate's mind concerning his decision to offer himself to the goddess's service. Most importantly, he explicitly highlights the parallel between the eunuch of Kabili and the Dionysian Maenad. The Roman poet plays with the emotions of one now stranded on the other side of his bloody deed, uh, stuck with the reassurance of a future life dedicated to the feminine, to the ecstatic and the other. All right, well, there's oodles more that I could mention about Kabili, but I think I'll leave it at that for now. If you're really interested, you can read my book, Shaman.